Welcome back to The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. What's next is off the press. It's the segment of The Breakfast where we take a look at the top newspapers in Nigeria and the stories that are making headlines. Let's say good morning to our guest, a public affairs analyst, Mr. Femi Lawson. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. All right, let's begin with the Punch newspaper. Headline says, COVID-19 business booms. Inbound travelers bribe officials to evade tests. Experts warn of spike. Flight passengers bribe officials with 10,000 naira, 15,000 naira to underpay and evade test. Virologists knock officials, alleged evaders responsible for high community transmission. Above that headline on the Punch newspaper, Nigeria, South Africa, Egypt and Kenya hold 80% investments in Africa. That's according to the African Development Bank, AFDB. FG places 3,964 Nigerians on watch list, suspends passports. The federal government says that 330,000 Nigerian refugees are in Chad, Niger, and other countries. ASU meets next week over planned strike, laments government's inactions. Nigeria needs 840 billion doses, 40 billion naira, to close energy shortfall, um, says Buhari. Northern governors meet on VAT today, sans spirit Malami. Kwara man who allegedly buries nine year old with 1,000 naira notes arrested. ICPC arraigns two suspects for defrauding RCCG of 10 million naira over land. Abductors free 10 more Baptist students, keep 11 victims. Um, Adeboye says Nigeria will surmount current travails and emerge in victory. Fashola Akpabio disowned groups promoting ministers' 2023 campaigns. Lagos Clubhouse kicks as 100 policemen thugs demolish buildings, arrest workers. And lastly, on the Punch newspaper, Forex crisis. Massive job losses loom. Profits shrink, says MEN. Others. All right, let's now look at the daily independent newspapers. The big one there says CBN may tackle FX crisis with Naira devaluation and rate hike. Also, North will use numerical strength to quash zoning in 2023, says the AOICF. APC needs rugged chairman to stay in power for the next 50 years, and that is from uh, Sheriff Ali Moru Sheriff, a senator. Also, Oshibanjo says Nigeria will overcome security and economic challenges. Nigeria at 61, Wiki blames leadership failure on the nation's woes. And also, we must reconcile and forget past issues and move forward. And that is from the Alafin. Uh, we also see here at UNGA 76, Buhari returns with special assignment from World Body. Airlines consider fair adjustment, lament Naira free fall. And finally, Nigeria's re revenue projections for 2022-2023, a mirage, says analysts. Mm. On the Nation newspaper, zoning tears PDP apart. Makinde Anim lead opposing groups stormy days ahead. 60 held over mob lynching of policemen in Lagos. Street begging al Majri not Islamic, says Sultan. Rising air travel raises hopes of new carriers. German SPD leads in race to succeed Merkel. Police, bankers clash in Ijebode. Boko Haram attacks Babangida town. Bianca, why I shunned APC Abgaz rally. Abductors free 10 students in Kaduna. Nigeria at 61 remains Africa's shining star, says Oshimbajo. That's Rao. Firms remit August returns to FIRS. All right, now let's uh, see what we can find on the um, leadership newspapers. Nigeria at 61. We can't build a nation with bigotry and nepotism, say uh, no, uh, Northern governors. And also warn against defining people based on religion and tribe. 
say demarketing Nigeria comes with great consequences. Also on the leadership, Sadiku bows out, leaves legacy of profits and transparency at uh, NIPC. Niger gets $86.64 million Islamic loan from Mina Bida, or rather for the Mina Bida Road. Ganduji appoints Ibrahim Gaya as MI of uh, Gaya. And uh, we can also find APC committed more resources to diversify Nigeria's economy than the PDP. That is from the Senate President Ahmad Lawan. Six northern states' economy under threat. And also 10 more abducted Bethel Baptist students regain freedom. Uh, finally, pension assets uh, investment in federal government securities hit 8.51 trillion naira. Good morning once again to Femi Lawson. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Good morning. All right, so let's, uh, let's probably start this conversation with the release of 10 more Bethel Baptist uh, students. Um, we'll quickly react to that. Well, uh, it's, a, it's a welcoming development, even though it is still very sad that uh, not all of those children have been released and reunited with their families. It is very sad that in the presence of all this, nothing has been heard about the role of the government in ensuring the release of these children. It has purely been the effort of the parents and the authorities of the institutions where they were kidnapped. Today, the government of Cardinal, the government of Cardinal State, and even the federal government, has remained silent and have left these children to their own fate and whatever effort can be undertaken by their parents. It is very sad. We are only hoping that these uh, terrorists will be you may enough to release the rest of these children, you know, to join their families and get, you know, the freedom again, because uh, it is traumatizing really to have school children abducted for this number of days and everything still looks normal, you know, in that state. Okay. I want us to take a look at the top story on the Punch newspaper. It talks about um, people making business out of the COVID-19 pandemic and, it, you know, the requirement of Nigerians who are traveling out or you know, coming into the country to take COVID tests. Now, an investigation here by the Punch showed that, you know, inbound travelers basically bribe officials at the airports to evade tests and that um, they do so with about 10,000 naira, 15,000 naira, and that's to make sure that they do not, you know, take this COVID-19 test and that that's really why COVID-19 is spreading in the country because these people evade tests and basically go ahead to interact with Nigerians. Um, what we saw the possibility of this, you know, when the pandemic um, broke out and, you know, there was a return, a resumption of flight September 5th, 2020, about, you know, claims that Nigerians were paying, you know, to avoid taking this COVID-19 test. What do you think the Nigerian government should do and, you know, stakeholders in those sectors should do? Because, I mean, these are people who should be making sure that these um, inbound travelers, you know, stay protected by taking this test and, you know, safeguard other people. But what should they be doing now to make sure that, you know, this COVID-19 pandemic, basically, you know, the curve is flattened? You think what we are currently experiencing, I don't think the government of Nigeria, in particular, the authorities in charge of our you know, airports and other, you know, entry points into the country, can do anything differently from what these people that investigations have exposed now are doing. In fact, the torture you are currently witnessed as far as the COVID-19 protocols and the attempt to evade it by most travelers are concerned today. It's aided by the government itself because I've, I've been fortunate to travel just twice after this uh, old lifting of suspension on air travel and uh, you know, opening of our border, and you realize that the Nigeria state is perhaps one of the few countries that have commercialized this pandemic rather than making it a system that will ease, you know, the challenges that we face by citizens, both Nigerian citizens and, you know, foreigners. In fact, I can even tell you that the government has made it more difficult for our own citizens to travel in and out of Nigeria 
just because of the level of exploitation that is happening around this, you know, travel in the name of the COVID-19 restrictions and protocols. So the culture of breathtaking and every other thing you are witnessing is encouraged by the government because, for instance, all it requires to go into a country like Ghana and come out is to conduct simple tests as required as agreed by ECOWAS for $50 and you move. But in Nigeria, we are finding a situation where by all sorts of levies, in actual fact, they recommend where you take this test. Citizens are made to pay more than the required $50 as agreed. Then you find people coming into Nigeria placed on the all sorts of levies, including, you know, fees for, you know, isolation and whatever you call it. So these are things that have been aided by government itself. Well, I guess Mr. Lawson, um, we lost connection with him. We're going to definitely reconnect with him and uh, continue with these discussions. Um, he was speaking mostly about, you know, the um, COVID-19 and, you know, a little bit of corruption here and there, which is not necessarily surprising. You know, of course, very, very bad and dangerous uh, for the rest of Nigerians. And also looking at the fact that, you know, the population that has been vaccinated is still so small. Um, and reaching herd immunity, I don't, even, I don't even know if that's a target for us, you know, but if, if reaching herd immunity is a target, it will take a really, really long time before we get there. So um, Nigerians need to do better, you know, from the immigration to, you know, the people at the airports, passengers themselves. Uh, we need to do better uh -huh. because it's, 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 it's in no way helpful. Um, and of course, we've seen the numbers, you know, Lagos, uh, you know, in particular has had, you know, 100 plus numbers in the last um, couple of weeks. Um, day, uh, daily numbers, you know, which is really not even uh, exciting. Mm. Um, so Nigerians need to do better, definitely. I, I think for me, regarding this story, would be the question why? Why, why does this happen? You know, I, I liked how we put it, the commercialization of the COVID-19 pandemic. Is it because, you know, these officials are available to be bribed, are ready to be bribed? Is it that these people actually go ahead and approach these inbound passengers to say, you know what? You can, I can spare you this stress. Just give me 10,000, 15,000 naira, and you will, go you will just go scot-free without having to take a test. Yeah, or is it the Nigerians themselves? Because, I mean, they're coming from other countries where they understand protocols and procedures. And you know that you dare not try such in the US or in the UK. You, you would be arrested and prosecuted. So is it because there's a Nigerian um, environment, a Nigerian society that just takes, that just allows for carelessness, that just allows for corruption? You know, really, why exactly does things like this thrive in this part of the world? Well, it's pretty, well, it much, seems we pretty have much saying, you know, th there's someone who's readily, uh, who has cash ready available to beat, you know, the uh, law or to break the law. There's somebody who is willing to receive. So it's pretty much the same thing. There's still a little bit of that corruption. And because we, once again, you know, have continued, we have failed, you know, to create systems that checkmate these things. Um, but to be fair, outside the country, I think in the U.S., there's also people who are selling fake vaccination cards, you know, to people. Uh, for a few dollars. I heard about that over the weekend. But we're sure that if those people are caught, they would yeah. be prosecuted. But yeah. you can't exactly say that for certain I'm crimes. Just, just, I'm just, I just wanted to put that out, that it's mm. not just in Nigeria, that there will be a little bit of corruption with, with COVID-19. Mm. Um, Femi Lawson, welcome back. This uh, huge cost that ordinarily they have been exposed to in the name of you know, enforcement of this protocol. So government must make you know, these things as simple as it should be. You should make traveling into Nigeria and leaving Nigeria as simple as it is in, comp in compliance with the COVID-19 protocol without unnecessary exploitation you know, and fee charging, which we you know, encourage people to begin to boycott you know, the processes of payment or trying to pay lower than they should pay ordinarily, which is not promoting corruption around what ordinarily is the pandemic that should worry all of us. All right. Femi Lawson, let's, let's move to something on the Daily Independent, the top right corner, top left corner, sorry. It says, the North will use numerical strength to quash uh, zoning in 2023, and that's from the AYCF. Um, so let, let's get your thoughts on that one also. It seems like a very big, uh, interesting discussion. Well, uh, I don't think uh, Nigeria should really take uh, the Yerima AYCF uh, unnecessarily serious. Because uh, the issue of zoning is beyond uh, 
you know, what people think they can sit in the comfort of their living room in Kaduna, Abuja, or anywhere to, to decide without giving due, you know, cognition to the sensitivity of the issue of zoning itself. Zoning is a question of morality, it's a question of fairness, equity, and justice with democracy in this part of the country, if the world is built upon. And the truth is that every time they talk about this numerical strength, I think we should begin to interrogate the numerical strength that this element from the North are always laying claim to. Where is the numerical strength? Where President Buhari contested election three times and was winning election in the North, but never won election as the Nigerian president in 2015, 2007, and 2011. Were there no numerical strength? Are they also assuming that the numerical strength extends to Kwara, Kogi, Benue, Klaatu, another middle belt, you know, region of this country that they have forcefully coerced in, into the name of the RNY consultative or whatever they call it. So it is beyond their mere wishes. Power rotation is a moral agreement, even though it is not a constitutional match, matter. But it's a moral agreement which must be respected. And it is only fair that after eight years of two terms for President Buhari, the power should rotate to the other region of the country. So we don't take care, and I don't think we should take people who just allocate figures to themselves without any factual basis. You know, serious when 2023 is being discussed. Yeah, but um, Mr. Lawson, how do you think this can also be checked? Because like you've mentioned, um, a lot of times these persons um, really just pull in states from the middle belt to themselves um, and, you know, create that assumption that those numbers are inclusive of the northern numbers that they talk about. Um, but is there ways that you think that this can be corrected or can be checkmated um, to, you know, prevent false narratives and, and electron figures that may not really... Um, co you know, correlate with what the true figures are. Well, that is already been done, and that is, if you see, you will realize that more than ever, you can see an alliance of you know the South and the Middle Belt uh, stronger than it has ever been in the last couple of years. You know, seen for uh, like the Southern and Middle Belt Leaders Forum and other groups coming together. You see the people of Middle Belt, you know, coming together more than it has ever been. You know, to advocate for common interest. As I want to insist that this not as represented by people like AYCF, Northern Elders Forum, and you know, does not have any number numerically to determine who becomes the president of Nigeria. And what is to be done, just like you have asked, is that we continue to expose these atrocious figures that are always been bandied around. We must continue to educate the people that when you talk about the North, the North, the North, you must be able to clearly define it, especially when it comes to political, you know, interpretation that has made people like AYCF and the NEF and the like to continue to assume that they have the numerical strength on the basis of the States, which is not true. I will continue to do that. Okay, um, I want us to go back to the Punch newspaper now. There's a story here that talks about this VAT controversy, and it's on the top um, right corner. It says, Northern Governors meet on VAT today, SAN's Berit Malami. So we know that this VAT controversy really has been going on for a while, ever since the River State Government took this to court and won the right to receive VAT in their state. Now, um, we know that the Northern and Southern governors have different opinions on it. Those ones in the South say they will collect their VAT and have gone ahead to pass you know, this law in their state. But in the North, they say that states have no power to collect VAT, and that should be the sole responsibility of the FIRS. They have a meeting scheduled for today to discuss this. What do you think the outcome of that meeting might be, Mr. Lawson? Well, I don't envisage uh, any other thing than the fact that the northern governors will likely come out you know, to stand by the federal government because a lot of uh, the northern states today you know, are beneficiaries of the Fidimbotu democracy that has made our states so lazy and unproductive. And they have to wait on taxes from other states, another region, another people's mineral resources 
before they can survive. One would have expected that uh, the dispute over VAT will quicken the process of restructuring. We'll, we are working the consciousness of our state to become more productive and be able to generate income to run the state. But these people are still very much interested in going cap in hand to Abuja every month to, to receive allocations to run their state. It means they are not viable. And now that the issue is before the court, I would want to advise that we all look forward to whatever the decision of the court will be on this. This is going to be very historic as far as our democracy is concerned. So I don't think the Northern government will in any way do anything differently from what a lot of them have been saying, especially when you listen to the governor of Katsina, Gombe, Katsina, all of them in the past, you realize that they, 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 they want to keep benefiting from the parts which they are contributing little or nothing to, you know, in the name of the FIRS power on the DAT. So I think uh, we should not expect anything depending on what they are saying. All right. Now, let's also look at um, uh, the president's UN General Assembly, um, you know, speech. And it says here on the Daily Independent, uh, Buhari returns with special assignment from world body. And that's with regards to the UN uh, GA 76. Uh, so quickly, share your views on the president's speech at the UN General Assembly. I think there was also something he had uh, discussed with um, uh, the um, leader of the uh, Netherlands. And then also the special assignment from the world body. Come again, please. I'm, I'm saying, you know, can you share your thoughts on President Muhammadu Buhari's time at the UN General Assembly 76 um, that took place sometime last week? And then on the Daily Independent, bottom right of the screen, it says there that the President, uh, President Buhari returns back to Nigeria with a special okay. assignment from the world body. Right. Well, uh, it is good that uh, President Buhari was fiscally present at this session of the UN General Assembly. And uh, it's also impressive that he uh, was able to make certain categorical demands. And it's also, also very good that as a takeaway, he has also been advised to go back home and play a critical role in addressing the question of insurgency, not only in Nigeria, but around the region you know, of West Africa where you know, terrorism is on a fast, you know, imagine uh, trend. But it is very good that we remember that President made a plea for Delta nations to consider the possibility you know, of uh, writing off our debt again, like we have always been uh, asking. But I don't think uh, it is also morally correct for us to be seeking debt cancellation at a time where we are even making bids for fresh loans from these same, you know, countries that we are asking to cancel our debt. Because it looks more like we are not coming to equity with thin hands. We must be ready and be willing to show that we are now able to be productive. We are able to at least finance and run our country without necessarily resorting to external borrowing before we can begin to make this kind of plea that President Buhari made you know, during his trip to the UN General Assembly. And on the issue of terrorism, I do not want to totally agree with the president where he claimed that uh, Boko Haram has been dealt with, even though they still exist. I think it sounds more a little bit contra contradictory, especially when you look at what the Iswab, the Boko Haram, has been doing in the last couple of years in, the, in Nigeria. Only yesterday, we were reading reports of an ambush you know, on a number of our military personnel, and we are not only battling with Boko Haram in the Northeast any longer, but also in another trend of terrorism in the Northwest that is spreading fast even to the Middle Belt and other parts of the country. So I think these are the challenges that President Buhari must take uh, seriously, especially that he has been admonished to go back home and also address the issue of uh, terrorism, not only in Nigeria, but around this region. 
Oh, I think that's my view. Okay, I also want us to look at this story. Um, it's also on the the Nation newspaper. It says 60 held over mob lynching of policemen in Lagos. And we spoke about this last week, um, Mr. Lawson, that police officers had gone to Ajao Estate um, to basically arrest um, mm -hmm. motorists, you know, basically people who drive what is popularly known as Okada in Nigeria. They said, you know, this is banned in Nigeria, and all people who, you know, had those were going to be arrested and their motorcycles seized. But these people seem to have had, you know, that up to their necks. They attacked the police, um, the police were, they vandalized their, their vehicle and allegedly killed one of the police officers there. So the story on the, on the Nation newspaper on the top left corner is saying that 60 people have been held, have been arrested over the death of this, political, this uh, particular police officer. Do you think an arrest really is, you know, even though it's good, you know, we're talking about prosecution of, of, you know, this particular case, but do you think the arrest really would do anything regarding this matter? Because we know it's something we've seen, you know, week in, week out. The policemen and um, motorcyclists basically clashing in Lagos, especially in the Obalinde area of Lagos and around the Keja axis. And do you think the ban on bikes in Nigeria is something that really would work? Well, it's... It Banning motorcycle, especially those that I call unregulated, you know, motorcyclists, it's an inevitable change. When you consider the security situation in the country, a lot of times it is easy for us to hide under the guise of unemployment and the lies, and we need to encourage people to do something, you know, and begin to justify the operation of this motorcycle. But whether you like it or not, for a group of people that could assassinate a chief superintendent of police, a senior police officer tells you how dangerous this group of people have become. Let me also remind you that the most dangerous situation with where we have found ourselves now is that you find these people moving into our community in droves, unregistered, undocumented motorcycles, undocumented, and a lot of them are even illegal immigrants from Chad, Niger, and every other part of the, of the region. But they are here operating, and you must blame the government. In order of fact, I want to hold the government responsible for the death of that policeman. Because if, it's, if we have to lose our security personnel, before we start tracing who did this and who did that, tells you how serious the state is about dealing with this madness that these motorcyclists have constituted, you know, in, in, in Lagos and every other part of the country. It is possible that we have motorcycle operation in some part of the country, state to ease the burden of transportation. But in so doing, these operators must be documented. They must not be seen riding on registered motorcycles. They must not be seen riding without flight. Sometimes you even see them as young as 16, 17 year old riding motorcycles. The state is promoting lawlessness, and that's why we are paying for it with the life of the lives of that innocent policeman that was killed. So beyond arresting those 61 or there about people, the government must be serious in ensuring that we limit the influx of these illegal immigrants into our society and begin to document who is who, whether you are a motorcycle rider, whether you are a chart pusher, whether you are a shoe shiner or whatever. The influx is alarming and it's a major security threat, not only to the security agencies, but to even ordinary innocent people of the state who are now so vulnerable. And there are times people are just driving in their vehicles and they have, you know, minor accident with these motorcycle operators and before you know it you know there's a mob action and people are vehicles are distressed sometimes people are lynched so the state must not wait until they kill policemen or any other personnel before taking a drastic action against these activities of motorcycles that is becoming a menace you know in legal states all right. Um, Mr. Lawson, I think you can just go on with this because we're about to wrap up. So I want you to share your thoughts on what you think should be done. Should, you know, motorcycle, um, you know, these motorcycles be completely banned from Lagos State, seeing that, of course, there's still, 
uh, some lack with the trans public transportation system. Um, and how can they be better regulated? Um, I want you also put, to put into consideration that a lot of these persons that we're seeing riding motorcycles, if we're, you know, being honest, a lot of them may not even be from Nigeria itself. Um, how can this be regulated? And do you think that we can even still pull this off? Uh, you see, the question of motorcycle even a problem of unemployment, I'm beginning to disagree with it at this point because I've realized that most of the people who now operate motorcycles in Lagos are not even Nigerian. A lot of them are not even from here. And I don't think the Lagos State government is under any obligation to provide employment space or opportunity for foreigners who are illegally in our country, who are not documented. So as far as that concerned, those illegal immigrants operating motorcycles have to be eradicated completely. And perhaps we still have reason to retain local operators who can be profiled, whose identity can be known. Their operation has to be limited to particular areas of the state, especially when we also consider that the state has not been able to do enough in addressing the problem of transportation vis-a-vis -vis the nature of our roads, you know, and the, you know, the inadequacy of public transport system. But if we would have motorcycles operating as a means of transportation, not on our major highway, but to use transportation in selected areas in the state, it must be operated by people who are known to Lagos and to Lagos people. Not these aliens who are traumatizing and who are killing our policemen and, and harassing our citizens. All right. Femi Lawson, thank you very much for your time uh, this Monday morning. And of course, we wish you a very beautiful Monday ahead and a great week. It's my pleasure. Absolutely. Stay with us when we come back. We're going back in history to 2008 to share with you some very major feat that was achieved by China on this day in history. Stay with us.